Thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for uh, um, organizing this conference and for inviting me. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we do precisely what is indicated in the title of, uh, of the conference, which is to start bringing uh, some of the results that have been um, uh, generated through the pioneering work of people like David uh, Eslin here uh, into contact with questions of institutional design. Uh, once we have grips on uh, you know, the, the, the question of what democracy is good for epistemically, how do we realize that in actually existing sort of institutional forms? And it's a very important question for political philosophers, or set of questions for political philosophers to start uh, thinking about. So let me say, um, I, I don't know how many people have actually uh, uh, read the papers. Not I'm not going to... Um, not many. Not many? Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm going to, uh, obviously I'm not going to read the paper. I also don't have any PowerPoint. So I'm just going to try to bring um, out the main... Uh, <laughs> the main points and the shape of the main arguments, which are still quite messy. Uh, apologies to my uh, commentator uh, for that, or parts of them are quite messy. Uh, maybe I'll say a little bit uh, something for, about the rationale for this, uh, for this paper. Uh, about two or three years ago, those of you who, who are from this country uh, know that uh, we had an election campaign where our now prime minister, Justin the Good, uh, announced that uh, <laughs> The election of that he was the, the election that gave rise to his election uh, would be the last one to be fought under first past the post in Canada. Um, he was in third place at the time where he made that statement in the polls. Uh, he won, and all of a sudden uh, it looked like um, electoral reform was not uh, as big a priority as. Uh, uh, seemed to be the case when he was uh, in third place. So we had a kind of an aborted debate over uh, electoral reform. Now, there is in Canada a bit of an electoral reform um, sort of mafia uh, of people who think that uh, we have the worst possible system in the world and that clearly, clearly, uh, everything would be made uh, a lot better if we were to go to uh, proportional representation. Uh, one of the parties here uh, just wrapped up its convention uh, in uh, Quebec Solidaire, which is the left-wing provincial party just wrapped up its uh, convention and one of the um, one of its uh, platform planks is to move uh, Quebec uh, to um, a, a proportional representation when I first started thinking about these issues before uh, just in the good um, I thought that uh, it was indeed the case that proportional representation would do a lot better uh, by uh, criteria of fairness equality uh, than does first past the post the uh, um, drawbacks of first past the post uh, are well known. Uh, they tend to uh, lead to problems of uh, wasted votes. Uh, whether when you vote in a riding and your candidate loses by two votes, you get zero, uh, just as much as if your candidate loses by 20,000 votes. Similarly, if your candidate wins by 20,000 votes, you get no extra representation relative to a case where your candidate would have won by only two votes. And so there seems to be a kind of a distortion. Uh, present. Now, uh, when uh, we started moving in the direction of electoral uh, reform for real, I thought um, maybe before we throw the baby out, uh, maybe before we throw the, forget about that, uh, I'm not going to use that metaphor. <laughs> You know, are there are there virtues to first past the post that we would be um, that that we would be sacrificing were we to move too quickly in the direction of uh, what is amongst I think electoral uh, pundits and uh, people who have written about electoral reform a bit of an orthodoxy, namely that proportional representation is the way to go. And to my surprise, over the course of the last couple of years, I found myself becoming more and more uh, feeling more and more warmly about first past the post uh, and more and more sort of skeptical about the virtues and promises of proportionality. And so um, the pa this paper essentially makes a case against a certain way of thinking about proportionality. I'm not sure or not, I'm, I'm not sure at this point whether it makes a, the case against proportionality as a principle for evaluating electoral systems as a whole. The point that I want to make is that PR systems as they are presently uh, sort of defended uh, and instantiated in a lot of countries seems to me to be um, uh, have problems that are at least worth thinking about uh, before we decide whether in Quebec or in Canada or indeed elsewhere to move away from first past the post. So um, the paper essentially, uh, those of you who've heard me talk before know that you know there's a, there's a joke which I think accounts for about 80% of philosophy. The rest of it is other jokes, but I'll just tell uh, this joke, and for, for, forgive me for those of you who uh, have already heard it 20 times, uh, the joke is about the guy the, looking for keys uh, under a uh, street light. Uh, a good Samaritan passes by, uh, gets down on his hands and knees, starts looking, uh, and after a few minutes says, look, uh, you know, friend, I think we've covered this area uh, quite well. Uh, you know, are you sure you dropped your keys here? And uh, the guy says, no, I dropped them over there, but there's a lot more light here. Um, and I think that a lot of the time we are tempted by um, systems that um, are, are kind of clear, 
or philosophical arguments that have a certain amount of clarity, but that don't get to the issues that we actually want to uh, get to, which are a lot more uh, messy. What do I mean by that? So proportional representation purports to do the following thing. It purports to match outcomes, income, in inputs and outcomes of electoral systems in a certain way. Those in, in, the, in, the inputs are votes, the outcomes are seats in uh, some kind of a parliamentary uh, system. Um, and there's a very simple you know, formula uh, that allows you to achieve proportionality. If you have 30% of the vote, you should have 30% of the representation, uh, all things equal. Or as I put it in the paper, if you had a pie chart uh, that uh, sort of gave you the distribution of votes and a pie chart that gave you the distribution of seats, those pie, ch pie charts should be uh, identical. Um, so there's something very pleasing and um, intuitively plausible about proportional representation. And the argument that I make in the paper uh, is that despite this intuitive plausibility, um, the conception of the inputs and of the outputs that it makes use of are normatively wanting. In other words, uh, the output of simple representation in parliamentary uh, fora is not the one that we should be concerned with. And perhaps a little bit less obviously, because I think the case, that case for me has become sort of extremely apparent and uh, in my mind a bit of a slam dunk and uh, uh, I don't spend that much time about it in the paper. Perhaps less, less obviously, uh, not enough uh, thought has been given amongst PR theorists about the kinds of inputs that it makes sense to match to outputs within PR systems. So very quickly, the case against thinking of um, seats in parliament as the appropriate kind of, um, of, of output. So um, as is well known, proportional representation systems um, tend to give rise to, uh, or tend, tend not to give rise to uh, immediately post-election majority governments. Uh, in, given the normal distribution of political opinion within uh, a population, uh, the thought is that uh, there will be a party most of the time that comes out with 25 or 30 percent of the vote, which will be the, 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 the big party, which will then have to fish around for uh, coalition partners with which to uh, govern. Um, those coalition partners can have very few uh, votes and therefore very few seats, but depending on the math, uh, can end up wielding uh, quite a lot of power in the negotiations leading to the uh, making of a coalition. And that's the point that I emphasize in the first part of the paper. I use a little toy example. If you and your friend are walking by a store uh, and he sees something that he absolutely wants uh, that's, that costs $1,000, he has $900 in his pocket and you have $100. Uh, and uh, you know you fix the example in such a way that uh, you know there's no alternative. He either has to make a deal with you uh, or else forego uh, the good. Imagine the good is a shareable one. Um, you know what bargain will you be able to drive with uh, your friend? Well, certainly, unless you're a really really crappy negotiator, you'll be able to do a lot better than 10%, which is the numerical value of what your share of the cost would seem to entitle uh, you to. Arguably, you should be able to get uh, you know, as much as 50%. Your contribution is as important to the possibility of being able to uh, buy the object as is his $900. Uh, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, the, the example could be complicated in various ways, but the point is to say that um, that you uh, have a certain amount of a certain currency tells you nothing about what you will be able to purchase uh, with that uh, currency. Uh, now, um, in the case of proportional representation, I think that in a lot of empirically observable uh, scenarios, Smaller parties, parties that have not been able to uh, generate much in terms of share of the vote, find themselves in much the same position as the person with $100 in their pocket, namely uh, having less of the currency uh, that is required in order to achieve seats, but ha being able to parlay that lesser uh, share into a greater disproportionate amount of uh, political uh, influence. Now, there are all kinds of ways in which this effect, which I think is a systematic effect, what I, the point that I want to make in the paper is that it's not a contingent, accidental thing that happens once in a while. It is, for defenders of proportional representation, a feature rather than a bug. That we not get to immediate post-election majorities is something that is supposed to speak from a certain point of view as a virtue rather than a vice of uh, the system. So, there are uh, ways in which uh, this uh, sort of consequence of uh, proportional representation systems can be allayed. Um, there are mathematically possible distributions of votes such that a larger party is able to play smaller parties against one another. If it needs two or three parties with 
a few percentage points and there are five or six that have uh, the requisite amount of uh, votes, well, it can always uh, bargain uh, parties down, as it were, uh, in order to get them into Parliament. But these are, this is a sort of a risky, if one is really concerned with proportionality, and if one thinks that proportionality should have to do not just with the structural feature of seats in Parliament, but with what, is actu what one is actually able to do with uh, seats in Parliament, uh, then it is quite a fragile bulwark uh, against disproportionate um, influence. Uh, on uh, electoral on po policy outcomes by smaller parties, um, that in certain circumstances uh, one is able to play certain small parties uh, against one another. When I gave this presentation somewhere else, uh, an Italian colleague uh, mentioned to me that uh, in Italy there was a sort of unspoken pact amongst larger parties that some of the smaller extremist parties will never be uh, sort of um, you know th that they will never be made into parliament. Again, these are empirical sort of contingent bulwarks that are put in place in order to counteract sort of systematic features of the system. And uh, they are, by their very nature, therefore somewhat fragile, uh, because that uh, sort of shared commitment not to play ball with uh, par smaller parties that might be on the extreme is something that can always uh, sort of give way to political expediency. So that's the first part of the paper, um, which again seems to me to be something quite obvious, but insufficiently uh, sort of uh, brought out in the discussions about proportional representations, which is that when we think about what is really important, namely not just how many bums are on the chair in parliament, but what is actually done by those people in terms of policy outcomes, proportional representation reliably and for reasons that have to do with system rather than contingency give rise to disproportionate outcomes relative to that which really matters. So that's with respect to uh, outputs. Now, the second point I make in the paper uh, sort of very briefly and, and uh, a little bit tersely is that when we do start focusing on what really matters, namely policy outcomes rather than uh, bums in the chair, bums in the chairs in parliament, the principle, the structural principle of proportionality starts becoming a little bit less, uh, it's harder to imagine what this would actually mean. If we, what we are concerned with is uh, impact on policy outcomes, and we have 60% of the population that favors a coalition that favors policy X and 40% of the population that favors policy Y, it's hard to see, especially in certain kinds of cases where policies are not you know, uh, amenable to being split down the middle, uh, what proportionality would actually mean. So with respect to outputs, going back to my joke about the guy uh, looking for his keys under the, uh, we either have a clear thing for votes to be proportionate to, but it's not normatively significant, or we have a normatively significant thing for votes to be uh, proportional to, but it's hard to see how to apply proportionality in those cases. So that's with respect to uh, outputs. Uh, the sort of naive view that PR proponents have about outputs seems to me to be caught on the horns of that dilemma. With respect to inputs, uh, therefore votes, uh, the argument that I make is a little bit more tortuous and I'm still not sort of satisfied that I've formulated it in uh, the right kind of way. Uh, but the point is essentially this. So think about uh, the, the, the crudest, most sort of uh, bare bones conception of what it means to vote that you could imagine, right? There are no electoral, imagine a society in which there are ele no electoral campaigns, no pre-election debates, uh, but there is electoral competition. When you get to the ballot uh, box um, and imagine a system in which you have mandatory voting, there are names uh, on uh, the ballots and you get to put an X next to one of the names. Now. Again, sort of absurd example uh, which uh, suggests to us that what we're interested in when we think about voting is not the placing of X next to names. Uh, it is a process that leads up to uh, the placing of an X by uh, citizens uh, next to names. And so um, if we want a normatively significant input to figure in our story about proportional representation, we have to fill out the picture a little bit and ask ourselves what it is that is significant normatively, what it is that is, that is important normatively about the process that leads up to uh, the physical placing of an X next to a name on a ballot paper. Now, in other work, which I try uh, desperately to sum up in extremely terse, dense paragraphs in this paper, I basically argued for, um, for, for, the, for the following view. Um, elections, and this is something, a point that's been made by, uh, by, by Bob Gooden, elections in modern complex democracies um, should be about uh, what I refer to, again, in other work as platforms. 
uh, as political platforms. What I mean by a political platform is roughly this. A political platform is a proposal made standardly by a political party about how to articulate the policies which the party will put into place across the full range of policy domains with which government is entrusted to act. Um, a proposal which presents these um, these uh, propo a proposal which presents these policies um, as articulated according to a certain number of overriding values, right? Overriding values which can then be appealed to when, <clears throat> as is necessarily the case uh, just about in every uh, liberal democracy, trade-offs have to occur. Right? So when a trade-off has to occur between our commitment to an ideal theory, uh, an ideal policy with respect to education, an ideal policy with respect to health, um, rather than trade-offs occurring in a purely ad hoc manner, there will be some kind of set of values which we in the Conservative Party or we in the Labour Party or we in the Liberal Party or whatever can refer to in order to make the trade-offs other than just purely ad hoc. Um, so platforms in the view that I've uh, developed elsewhere, should be, as it were, um, the object of debate, that about which citizens uh, and uh, rep candidates uh, for election debate. Um, and the results of the citizens, again, according to this ideal picture, should vote according to their reckoning of who amongst the parties uh, has presented them with the most convincing uh, platform. That is a fairly substantial epistemic burden, right? Um, a platform is a complicated sort of cognitive object. It is something that requires uh, a lot of deliberation, compromise, uh, empirical input, uh, com combining empirical input with the normative commitments of the political party. And this is what ought to be uh, at the core of our um, deliberations. Now, the point I make in this paper is that uh, for reasons that have to do with just sort of very pragmatic considerations of epistemic carrying capacity of ordinary voters, you can't imagine, um, you can't expect citizens, as they think about the issues of the day, to come up with preferred platforms by themselves, right? So there's a picture which I argue in the paper, I suggest in the paper, is present in the proportional representation scheme, which is that um, people have sort of system-independent preferences, which are articulated through votes. And those system-independent preferences articulated through votes should be represented proportionately uh, at, the, uh, output, uh, at the output level. The point that I want to make in the paper is that um, system-independent political preferences do not have the cognitive, uh, do not meet the cognitive standards that we um, want debate over political issues to meet in order to give rise to votes that are um, normatively uh, meaningful. So rather than seeing um, elections as being about system independent political preferences and citizens trying to match their system independent political preferences uh, to political parties, we should see elections as proposals made by parties um, about, how, about what platforms uh, citizens should, uh, should, should consider and debate uh, in the run-up to, um, to elections. And again, I think that complicates, I'm going to probably end with this, because I'm probably running out of time. Three, three, three minutes. Um, I think that, again, complicates the picture for the PR um, theorist. Remember, the proportional representation theorist uh, wanted a fairly clean match between numbers of votes and uh, political outcomes. What I'm arguing is that, as it were, the uh, independent variable is not the political preference that the uh, citizen might have, but rather the platforms that are put forward by the political parties for which citizens will end up uh, voting. I'm pretty sure that that complicates the picture relative to the way in which standard PR um, uh, arguments are, um, are, are laid out. Whether it puts paid, whether it means that we should um, sort of cease thinking about proportionality as a normatively attractive principle uh, for electoral systems altogether, something that I'm not entirely sure about yet. Certainly, though, I think that uh, the standard case for proportional representation is one that succumbs to the joke with which I started uh, this uh, paper in that it is uh, excessively simplistic in the way that it uh, conceives of votes and of the outcomes that votes should be proportional to, uh, and that once we get out of the 
light which this sort of simplistic rendering of proportional representation um, uh, gives rise to and get out into the sort of murkier and muddier uh, waters which I think we should be uh, thinking about when we think about electoral systems, it's unclear to me whether proportionality would emerge as a desideratum uh, that still has any uh, legs. So I think I'll stop there yeah, okay. and uh, look forward to your questions. <laughs> So now I turn to uh, Aberdeen Berry for his her, her comments. <laughs> All right. So I thought this was a really interesting paper, and I was mostly on board with the claims made. So my critiques are fairly narrow, and they focus on two points. Um, before I get into the substantive critiques, um, I will make one uh, sort of caveat comment, which was I wasn't entirely sure of the register of the paper, how much it was inhabiting the realm of ideal theory versus um, engaging sort of with the, the practical contingencies. Um, so some of my critiques aren't entirely in the ideal register, um, but I think if we talk about more so the, the range of assumptions that are in place in the paper, I don't think I'll necessarily be engaging these sort of like category mistakes in terms of the critiques. So the main argument of the paper, uh, there's a range of normative concerns that go into developing or selecting an electoral system and the one that's taken center stage is proportionality, um, improperly concerned with uh, the relationship between votes and electoral seats or possibly policy outcomes. Um, and Weinstock's argument is twofold. First, uh, that we don't really have a firm idea of what's going on in proportionality as a practice or concept, and also that we aren't really pulling out the right inputs and outputs. Um, so I want to look at a couple of points of the argument and offer some critical questions. So the first is that uh, Weinstock claims seats in Parliament do not guarantee proportionality of outcomes. Um, and it seems in the paper this is potentially a problem in one of two ways. Uh, the first is that if marginal parties hold the balance of power, they will have an outsized influence on policy development. Um, and the second is that it's not clear all policy developments or policy outcomes can be measured as proportional. We can't compromise on an in-between between a cap-and-trade scheme and a carbon tax, uh, whereas we might do something like legalize euthanasia in a narrow range of cases. Um, so the questions that emerge out of this, um, I, have, I have a few. The first is, uh, is the concern about the sort of fringe or marginal parties a procedural issue or a substantive concern? Um, if it's the case that simply uh, parties with a smaller constituency get outside influence, um, we might still make the argument that there's like a second best approach. Um, so we can imagine, for instance, um, because in the current Canadian system, we have riding the territor ter ter territorial representation, um, geographically dispersed minorities uh, right now get virtually no representation. Um, and we might argue that giving them slightly too much is better than none. Um, so if we consider an example, suppose Canada were to adopt PR and a First Nations Rights Party emerges. Um, this doesn't really seem like a group that would be normatively objectionable, and it also seems like violating proportionality more towards giving them a bit of extra votes or a bit of extra policy input would be better than the alternative, which is that they have virtually none and very little negotiating power in the current system. Um, that is to say, their interests could be readily sacrificed for other constituencies that offer votes. Um, so that seems to say, if we accept sort of a, also a lower threshold for what the proportionality theorists um, are concerned with, that is to say it's not perfect proportionality, but it's more or it's a slightly better proxy, um, that might provide uh, a, a sort of different account. Um, the second question then is, what about, are, are we explicitly concerned with uh, small fringe parties that empower really pernicious constituencies, such as far-right parties in Europe. Um, and then the question is, I guess, more so a matter of the sorts of contingencies that you were talking about before. Um, I think the sort of justification would be a bit different. And then the second uh, question I wanted to bring up was the relationship of votes and the expression of political preferences, specifically um, in terms of the sorts of negotiations you're going to see in big tent parties versus um, in a sort of coalition government. Um, so the main argument, as I understood it, was 
negotiation within big tent parties uh, both allows for greater voter information because they're voting on a platform um, and greater voter control um, because you can choose, you know, no, I want this platform, not just maybe, okay, party A might negotiate with party B, so like I could probably expect two out of these five policies. Um, so this strikes me as a plausible account, but I'm interested in hearing a bit more about uh, the structure of the negotiation in question. Uh, and my concern is that Professor Weinstock overstates the case for in-party negotiation by placing it outside of frameworks of power um, and assuming fairly strongly that it's about ideals rather than um, sort of pragmatic negotiation interest. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing a bit more about what range of assumptions around what's going on in negotiations and parties um, and how this might relate to uh, the expression of voter preference or the appropriate sort of discourse. Um, we might also frame this as a sort of internal critique um, in terms of the idea that as much as the political preferences of voters are not system independent, neither is the negotiation regarding the contents of a political platform. Um, it's not just a matter of uh, expressing the interests of various power groups within the party, um, but also a strategic decision to see what can get us elected. Um, so I'd be interested in seeing a bit more negotiation with that. Um, so in that case, it might still be true that, well, proportional representation, while not perfect, might be better in that those sorts of negotiations are going to be more transparent to voters, um, and they get to have a say in who the stakeholders in the negotiations are, rather than the big tent party where it's uh, fairly opaque. Um, I realize that's not pre precisely the only issue of proportionality, but um, that was just sort of a question that came to mind when I was reading the paper. Um, so I can basically sum up my response, my questions into two general questions. Um, for, the first is, might proportionality, even if understood uh, crudely, have systematic effects that then nonetheless better approximate the kind of proportionality PR advocates have in mind? Um, and then the second question is, as I just said, does the uh, platform approach work when we assume these sorts of uh, internal party coalitions are more power-based rather than idea-based? Um, and then is there something different about like the sorts of negotiations that go on uh, within parties versus uh, within parliaments, either un understood as PR parliaments or understood in the conventional first-past-the-post? Okay, that's all I've got to say. Thanks. It's a very interesting paper. Can we get a minute? Uh, okay. So thank you very much, Aberdeen. Those are, those are, great, uh, those are great questions. I'm going to link my answer to the, so you summed them up at the end into two sort of broad categories. So I'm going to start with the second because it connects with the very first thing that you said, which has to do with ideal, non-ideal theory, right? So um, I view myself as, in this, you know, in this paper and in other things that I've written, as doing with respect to democratic institutions, uh, something like what Rawls said he was doing with uh, you know, other political institutions within modern liberal democracies, which is engaging in uh, something uh, like a realistic utopianism. Uh, in other words, the idea is not to propose an al a totally alternative set of institutions um, relative to the ones that we have because they better fit with certain ideals, but rather what are the ideals that are latent within uh, our uh, sort of institutions that our institutions as they are presently embodied can then be sort of matched up to and compared to and seen as falling short of, right? So um, you, you uh, so it, it's kind of somewhere in the middle between ideal theory and non-ideal theory. Like pure ideal theory would view itself as not at all constrained by present institutional arrangements, right? Let's imagine completely different kinds of systems. Non-ideal theory would, would sort of bring in a lot of the messiness of real world politics uh, in the way that allows discussions about this sort of thing to descend into what they often descend into, which is that, yes, well, in Italy, you know, or yes, well, in, you know, Every uh, actual electoral system is sort of messed up in various ways. Uh, and the question that I think theorists have to ask themselves is, is it messed up because of extrinsic factors, um, or is it something that's sort of core to the very system itself that is uh, leading to, to dysfunction? Uh, and so, um, so it's somewhere in the middle. Now, if one were to look at um, political parties, say, in Canada, right, which are, and this allows me to say something that I forgot to say uh, in my actual oral presentation, which came out a little bit in the paper, which is that one of the things that, um, 
I want to argue for is for the epistemic virtues of a certain kind of party that tends to get pretty bad press, which is the big tent party that tends to get generated by first past the post. One of the virtues of it potentially right, is that because it brings together uh, groups who under proportional representation systems might be tempted to go it alone and form their own party, right, it forces the kind of negotiation, um, sort of deliberation uh, that gives rise to the kind of platform, the all kind of all-encompassing platform that I argue should be at the center of our democratic discussions, at least at election time. Now, anybody who looks at the uh, sort of actual functioning of uh, actually existing democratic parties um, has to realize that it don't work, it don't, don't always work that way, right? The leader has a disproportionate uh, impact, even amongst in parties that are. Um, you know, that view themselves as more, more, more democratic. We're not surprised to hear this about, you know, conservatives, but I would argue that even left-wing parties often find themselves. Uh, so this would require, there is potential within the big tent party to give rise to the kinds of epistemically virtuous effects that I argue for in this paper and in others. That potential would have to, in order to be realized, would have to be accompanied by a lot of uh, reforms. We have to think about ways in which political parties uh, should, could be organized in order to give rise to the kind of deliberation that generates the platforms uh, that I'm talking about. And those reforms um, pose problems. You know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the issues, for example, in Canada uh, that would, uh, you could make, for example, I mean, amongst the institutional fixes that you could imagine in order to incentivize parties or to even force parties to be less leader-driven, more sort of deliberative uh, internally, uh, would be somehow to um, tie funding uh, to certain kinds of internal structures, to certain kinds of internal deliberative structures. Uh, now, that would pose problems with respect to freedom of assembly, for example. It would pose problems when uh, public, uh, you know, public law, essentially, um, gets in the way of parties uh, being able to organize themselves whichever way they want, including uh, organizing themselves in ways that are quite leader-driven. So all this to say that first past the post, big tent parties have a kind of epistemic potential, which I think is absent from the kind of smaller, quote unquote, boutique parties that tend to get generated by proportional representation schemes. But that potential is not realized in uh, actually existing um, big tent parties and would need to be reformed in ways that are complicated, given the legal uh, context within which um, within which institutions, within which parties exist. With respect to the first uh, point, um, you're absolutely right, right? You can look at it from, you can look at the disproportion that is given rise to by proportional representation systems either as a bad thing, it lets neo Nazis in, or a good thing, it lets uh, disenfranchised uh, minorities, historically disenfranchised minorities in. So the argument that I would make there is if we want disenfranchised minorities to have le uh, political vo more political voice and uh, neo Nazis to have less, then let's enact policies that achieve that goal directly rather than through. Uh, indirection, right? Because you don't get one without the other, right? You, you're absolutely right that um, you, uh, um, you know, in, in PR systems, uh, it will tend to give rise to either the, no the more noxious or more uh, politically and ethically uh, defensible kinds of disproportions. Um, and so rather than throwing a, a hostage to fortune and uh, sort of just hoping that instituting PR in our country will give rise to a lot of the latter and not too, too much of the former, I think that the, if we really want to instantiate uh, more voice for disenfranchised minorities into our electoral system, let's do that directly rather than hoping that it'll occur as a kind of unintended, as a kind of a, a knock-on consequence of the adoption of an electoral system, which is defended not on the basis of uh, you know it's giving more voice to disenfranchised minorities, but on the basis of the fact that it is proportional, right? Proportionality is the virtue that is claimed by PR advocates. For, uh, for that kind of system. So to give you an example uh, of the kind of thing that we already do in Canada, um, we have, um, so again, is it a bug, is it a feature? It depends on who you talk to. Uh, rural ridings in Canada, as Canadians here probably know, um, votes in rural ridings are worth up to, or da as little as, there, there is a, there, I'm having trouble expressing my, Crowded urban ridings, dense urban ridings, often have four, three to four times more population than um, uh, less dense uh, rural ridings, which means, from a certain point of view, that an urban vote is worth four times less or three times less than a rural vote. Now, is that a bug or is it a feature? Some people will argue that it's a feature, right? Canada is a country that is rapidly urbanizing, right, to um, make 
the uh, distribution of ridings strictly proportional to population would mean placing rural ridings in a kind of vicious cycle where they lose population and therefore lose political voice, losing political voice or less able to advocate for their regions and then lose more population and so you know the vicious cycle uh, uh, continues. So the idea that you have a sort of disproportion in the distribution of ridings is seen by many people as a feature, but a feature that is deliberately designed in. It's not that we build our electoral system around some other system like proportionality, hoping that the right normative consequences will fall out, but we identify the normative consequences and build the electoral system directly around them. So I think that you're absolutely right that disenfranchised minorities should have more electoral voice, but in order to get there, we should just give them more electoral voice rather than hope that they will get more of that electoral voice by building the system around proportionality. Thank you. Uh, so we can open the floor to questions. Yeah. Uh. So, hi, Zebra University of Michigan. Thank you so much for this paper. Um, it's really uh, uh, very invigorating to uh, to get uh, political philosophy uh, that conforms so closely to in the way that uh, pure political scientists sort of view things. Um, and I was wondering what. Uh, or how much you were drawing on empirical literature in from political science on PR. Um, stuff like Robert Dahl, I mean, William Riker, uh, kind of most skeptically, uh, even like more uh, contemporary stuff like Aiken Bartels, uh, Democracy for Realists, uh, seems to, to really like drive home exactly this point that uh, it just it's, it is nonsensical to think about uh, Representative democracies. We've constructed them as uh, ways of just uh, just aggregating the preferences of constituents, and, and thus PR uh, 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 proportionality um, is just not a good way of thinking of it. And, and, and I was just struck by your formulation about uh, political platforms. I mean, that's just this political science orthodoxy right there. Um, that is exactly what we're doing. You know, whether it's the Skip Rupias or the Aiken Bartels, like. It's about political. It's about our political platforms that we're endorsing, not about this aggregation of preferences kind of thing. So we're just interested to, to yeah. hear your reflections yeah. on, on the conversation. Yeah. So I've been reading a lot of it. Um, I think that the difference. I mean, the the Bartels, uh, the Democracy for Realists book is, you know sort of almost gives up on the, the hope for normative democratic theory altogether. There's a lot of information to be gotten there, and a lot of, I think, um, information that's relevant for normative theorists about pitfalls, about you know, unintended perverse consequences of, uh, of electoral systems. Sometimes aiming too high, right, in a certain sense, uh, can give rise to effects which if, you know, it's not like you get second best if you don't achieve the, you, you, get, you get something terrible. So, I would say, you know, I've read all the people that you uh, that you mentioned, though I don't uh, I don't cite them here. So I want to, for example, with respect to the, the ideal of a platform, I want to make the ideal of a platform central to a normative theory of democratic discourse. It is an idea that is both epistemically and morally important to the way in which we comport ourselves politically, and which hasn't been given enough, I think, normative formulation. It's epistemically important because it does what I mentioned this party in this paper, which is sort of try under the uh, sort of uh, um, guidance of some abstract kind of values <clears throat> to bring together in a more or less coherent whole all of the different things that governments are supposed to do, uh, as opposed to just try to sort of aggregate the issue-specific preferences that people might have in a variety of areas into something that might just become a com an, incoherent, uh, an incoherent mess. So it's got epistemic virtues. It's also got moral virtues because, uh, you know, a platform is something with respect to which uh, politicians can be held accountable. I mean, one of the absolute nostrums uh, of electoral systems uh, literature is that uh, though uh, First Past the Post doesn't have uh, much to say for it with respect to proportionality, it does have more to say for it with respect to accountability, right? It generates majority governments, majority governments which have been put to power, uh, put in power because of their commitment to a platform, and their status as a majority takes away from them an excuse which uh, parties in PR might have to say, well, you know, we would have um, we would have uh, uh, put this platform into effect, but you know, our our coalition partners, uh, you know, got in our way. Uh, majority governments don't have that excuse. Other contingencies can get in the way, obviously, uh, but you know, uh, when after four years. Um, you know, voters look at the platform, look at what's been done, and say, hey, you guys really haven't tried to do what you said you'd do. And, uh, well, it's a way of sort of instantiating accountability in a way which I think isn't matched by any other uh, system. So that's, 
not just sort of bare bones political science for realist sort of stuff. It, I think there's also some normative uh, freight that can be put behind those ideas, and that's what I'm trying to do. And that's why you know I sort of claim the um, uh, non utopian non utopian utopianism, sort of realistic utopianism for myself. Uh, you know, what is the normative potential of those institutions uh, that we see around us, though in their present instantiations, perhaps in highly sort of distorted or perverted forms? Yes, please. Thanks. Uh, Kevin, uh, sorry, Kevin, uh, Kevin Elliott from uh, Columbia University. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed this paper um, in terms of uh, bringing together the sort of concerns of institutional design and uh, uh, political philosophy ethics as uh, exemplary work um, in that thing. Uh, so, I, I have sort of just two comments, one sort of question, I guess they're both kind of questions actually, um, but the, the first is larger than the second. Um, so, uh, it, it's clear that you're in touch with the empirical literature here, even if it's not cited, um, and I think actually that might be an issue with the assumption about representation. Right. So specifically that uh, in saying that what we actually want to be represented is uh, not probably may not votes, uh, is something like preferences. Um, it seems to be partaking of this very, you know, very, uh, um, uh, it's all over the place, uh, view that, you know, representation is a kind of a second best to direct democracy. Right. Uh, and that's sort of um, extremely, you know, prevalent in the, uh, uh, in the uh, empirical literature. This is part of the problem with the Aiken and Bartel's book, of course. Uh, Andy Sobel has written about this, that like, they're assuming that what we want is responsiveness from our representatives, and in fact, uh, it's very difficult to find an actual democratic theorist who believes that that's the case. Um, and, and indeed, it's like, you know, where the literature on representation is now, right, is that in, with the constructivist term and maybe someone like Nadia Urbanati, makes these kinds of arguments that like representation really isn't a second best. There's actually robust reasons for thinking that you wouldn't want to, um, uh, as we call them, un potentially unnecessary cadre of middlemen and middlewomen. You know, these theorists would obviously just reject that account of representation. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. My other question is smaller, and it's just about, um, it's sort of actually an empirical question. I, I don't know the answer to this question, but it seems to me that the ideological distance between potential coalition partners in coalition formation uh, matters a lot, actually. Yeah. So um, in terms of what the um, bargaining leverage of these other potential coalition partners is going to be seems deeply uh, contingent on being close ideologically on the ideological sort of unidimensional <coughs> ideological space. Now, I don't know. That might not be true. You could convince. So why would that be an issue? Of course, um, well, it seems to drastically limit concerns about disproportionality, yeah. right? If the distribution of the votes were sort of, was sort of on the conservative side, and then you only get conservative parties of one kind or another in coalition, it limits concerns about disproportionality. Now, you could convince me that's not a real concern if it so happens that, like, you get weird coalitions with some frequency. <coughs> it's not my sense yeah. that that's true, but yeah. I don't know the comparative literature yeah. on that. So I'll start with the second question because it's easier. I don't know the comparative literature well enough. You know, there's a rule, as I've sort of drifted into this uh, literature, uh, more empirical literature, there's a, there's a rule. In moral philosophy, we have a rule, which is that, uh, you know, whenever you bring in Nazis, you're probably, you know, um, <laughs> don't bring in Nazis. Uh, uh, reductio ad uh, Hitlerum is, uh, you know. Um, and there seems to be an, 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 an analogous rule in the, uh, which is don't bring up Israel, right? Because every perverse consequence of electoral reform you can generate from some uh, episode in Israeli history. Where, uh, you know, for example, you know, um, El Al, so uh, I think it's still the case that uh, the ultra orthodox religious parties have managed to shut down El Al and the bus system on, um, on Shabbat. Uh, and they did that when they were uh, in coalition with a, with, a, with a labor government rather than with, uh, you know, Netanyahu or, or Begin. So I, I, really, I really do, you know, I mean, um, I mean, I have read some of the empirical literature, but I haven't read enough, you know, I am a, a philosopher and I, I have to get into this empirical literature uh, to a greater degree. Sometimes when I present some of this stuff, people think that I've been influenced by something which I've never heard of and I then rush and think, you know, I sort of philosophized my way into a conclusion that people have arrived at um, through empirical, which is, which is fine, but um, so I really do have to, I really do have to get, go into the comparative literature on, I still do think that you know, as someone who t take the take the thing that you know the the, the, the anecdote or the that uh, an Italian colleague uh, told me when I presented this work uh, in um, 
recently uh, in another in another conference. Uh, he said, "Well, you know, we don't have to worry about extreme right parties or you know, uh, communist extreme left in in Italy because there's a kind of a gentleman and gentleman woman's agreement that they're not going to be brought in." Well, you know, that's a little bit cold comfort, you know, because again, political exigency conventions are only as strong as the willingness of people to continue to abide by them. Um, so, with respect to the first question, so. This is obviously still a messy paper, and its messiness is brought home to me by the fact that it, you know, it is no uh, part of my intention to say that representation is a second best. Um, again, uh, working on the sort of realistic utopian mode, right? I want to say, well, what is it about representation and political parties um, that, that, that can be presented in a kind of an ideal or a normatively uh, affirmable uh, modality? And uh, for me, it is the fact that um, you know, political parties are those things that allow modern polities that have to deal with a wide range of wildly complex uh, policy issues that inter, if only for budgetary reasons, that intersect in complicated ways. Political parties are those things that we have invented that allow us to try to um, articulate full proposals, right? Um, and so uh, they are ineliminable, ineliminable for me, right, rather than... Um, uh, being sort of pale, uh, pale comparisons of, of a first best sort of direct democracy. Um, I have another. I have another paper about uh, a referendum and plebiscites, where I say essentially that you know the distorting impact of referendums and plebiscites is that they um, they sort of treat individual issues as if they were individual issues, whereas they really never are. Right? They're always tied in with um, a wide range of other policy issues, with from which they are artificially extracted uh, when we deal with things in a plebiscite or referendum. Um, uh, way so it's you know to the extent that anything I've written here can be read as um, thinking the representation is the kind of booby pri the second best uh, booby prize that we get because we realize that we're not able to organize direct representation direct uh, democracy for ourselves then I've obviously got some clarification still to do. Okay, so on my list we have um, Frédéric, uh, David, then François, right, and Peter. Okay, so we, we, we have uh, 15 minutes uh, left. Okay. And, 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 uh, oh, oh, Andre. Oh, okay. I'll be very so, brief. No, no, <laughs> right. So we have 15 minutes. Um, maybe we'll uh, take uh, two questions uh, in a row uh, at the end. But, uh, let's go. Okay, uh, so I, I just want to push a little bit uh, on Everdeen's first point. Because uh, I, 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 I think the response you gave. Uh, sort of worked on a, this analogy between the two. So I, I, I share the sort of sentiment that people uh, defending PR are sometimes too quick to dismiss the, the virtues of first fast and vote and, and, and post and the example you gave of giving uh, perhaps more power to uh, rural writings uh, in order to defend their territorial interests is very interesting. But the, Aberdeen's point, and she made it clear, was that sometimes these interests are not territorially yeah, of course. Uh, centered. And sometimes the, the, the interests of those groups are territorially dependent and not at the same time. Yeah. And uh, in your suggestion that we should just give them more uh, electoral power to them, I just don't see how it's, it can be done uh, without at least some degree of proportionality. So, uh, so I, I don't. So nobody is arguing for a full proportional system. Everybody is arguing for at least a hybrid uh, something with, with at least for Canada. So I'm, I'm just wondering why uh, how you could uh, connect these uh, these dots. So, um, I th so, so I th I I think that one of the things that we have to do when we think about democratic theory is we have to widen the lens in ways that I don't do in this paper, right? I'm focusing just on electoral systems. Electoral systems are enmeshed in uh, a more complex architecture of institutions. And when we think about the, um, the, the when we think about the adequacy of, a, of an entire sort of political system, we have to look beyond just the, um, the electoral system. I mean, if you think about indigenous people in, in um, in Canada, right? There have been a number of, um, of, of proposals that have been made uh, about how to entrench the, you know, the voice of indigenous people who don't have the sort of, you know, the sort of territorial, uh, they're, they're a majority nowhere, you know, sort of like African Americans in the United States, uh, they're, they're the, you know, they are minority everywhere. Um, there have been proposals about how to um, give them more power within electoral system, perhaps through, I mean, reform, second chamber reform, um, uh, that, that, that don't require proportionality. But the point, the point that I, the, the, I want to make is that you know, proportionality, as it were, as a pure structural 
uh, system isn't designed to give minorities that happen to be historically disenfranchised voice. It is designed to give everybody uh, voice proportionately. And so you get the normatively attractive and important, such as the cases that you and Aberdeen pointed to, and you get the uh, unattractive uh, ones as well. And you know, I want to say, let's design criteria and matching institutional fixes that allow us to express the normative, you know, the normatively important ideas that are present in wanting more voice, say, for indigenous people or for African Americans, rather than reaching for a structural feature which gets us the one and the ugly stuff and re requires that we engage in special pleading in order to uh, rule out the, uh, the, the, the ugly stuff. Um, do you see what I mean? Uh, sure, but I'm not sure I, I, I share the, the intuition that we really want the Nazi South. Because th there is hmm. an argument to be made that if they're hmm. in, they'll just show how, 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 how bad they are and they'll, they'll wreck whatever uh, support they have. Yeah. Already. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just not sure that I buy Yeah, it. I want the Nazis out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but there, 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 there are arguments that yeah, yeah, if, yeah, if yeah, they yeah, come into yeah, Parliament. Yeah. No, it, it's. <laughs> It's a very, it's a very important uh, uh, topic. I've, I've just been invited to contribute to a volume on. Uh, there's, a, there's a little sort of sub literature on something called militant democracy, right? Um, I can't remember the name. Alexander Kushner. Kushner yeah, has just written a book, and uh, you know, the basic idea is, you know, should we essentially outlaw, right, parties that um, uh, seek democratic, seek through democratic means to achieve undemocratic uh, ends? Um, so yeah, again, uh, you know, I, I think that um, it is it is throwing us a, a hostage to fortune in ways that I perhaps I'm not prepared to do, but I'd have to consider the argument to say, let them all in, you know, uh, and the Nazis will just flame out um, by just showing how, you know, uh, morally corrupt and idiot idiotic they are. Yeah, I'm. It could be that we just have it. I'd much rather sort of, you know, um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people. Okay, so, <laughs> David, David, please, uh, and then... Um, Daniel, thanks, a really interesting paper. Just uh, two quick things. First, a very quick comment that's very much supportive, uh, and that's that uh, you make this point um, that I think you maybe should lead with, which is eventually a decision gets made, and proportionality has to be left yeah. behind. Yeah. That's just fun, right from the beginning, yeah. that throws you know, into question the idea that proportionality is a requirement of fairness. At some point, we leave it behind. And you might consider adding something like this. Well, look, why not think the decision of the representative body, if we've decided on some other grounds we want a representative body, is a decision. It's a directly democratic decision, and proportionality can just be left behind like any other decision. And then there's still debates about whether for some other reason you want proportionality pragmatic. Okay. Um, anyway, it's very much in the spirit. Um, here's, here's an, uh, the second thing is um, a question, not a, not a criticism, but I'm not sure I understand the role of system independent. Yeah, um, and I'm not sure system, in, system independence really is yeah. what's... Um, uh, sometimes it gets constructed, and some, sometimes in the discussion, too, as if it's a dispute between sorry, whether what we want is platforms or preferences, but that seems to be not quite right. It's preferences in any case, right? It's not like aggregation of preferences versus platforms, because you want preferences over platforms mm -hmm. or something else. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's, and now, so if system independence has anything to do with it, then we've got two distinctions. We've got platform preferences versus, yeah. I guess what you're calling issue-specific issue. preferences, mm -hmm. then a very separate thing, and I'm not sure what the import of it is, system-dependent preferences versus system-independent right. preferences. Right. So then let me just finish with a question about that first dichotomy, which I think is what you're mostly yeah. talking about. And it's not really a criticism. I'm, I can start to think how much might go. I just want to draw you out. Why well, think that on what, on what grounds would we think people would be competent in their preferences over platforms? If they're not competent in their issue-specific preferences, you need that yep. asymmetry. And I just don't know how that's supposed to work because platforms are nothing but balancing the various issues. But is there some is there some reason why we have more competence over that? Yeah, I know we might invest less time in it because we just say oh, that one sounds good. But, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Thanks. The, the, so the first the first point I'll just take is I think you're right that uh, that that's a point that I should that I should give more uh, more more weight to. Um, with respect to the set, so as I was rereading the paper, I, I think you're right that I had an intuition about system dependence, system independence, which ended up not carrying any, um, you know, any wagons behind it, and it could be that it's down to down to that. So I'm not sure that this is an adequate answer, but this is the answer that I have for the time being, and uh, 
I'll have to think about whether I want to I want to continue building on it or not. So what I want to say is that, um, as it were, you know, um, there's a difference between us getting together as ordinary citizens who have all sorts of other things to do in our lives uh, and may not have the information required and the expertise required to deal with complicated budgetary or whatever, uh, getting together and say, Let, let's put together a political platform, right? Uh, or, you know, me going into my uh, study and, and saying, let's put together a political, pl I'll put together a political platform, uh, you know, the Weinstock political party. There's a difference between that and having uh, people who do have the time and uh, sort of expertise in order to do that put it together for me and then propose it to me, you know, have three or four such proposals put to me, sort of pre, you know, Ikea pre-built by these other people, and then I evaluate them. And I evaluate them in part on the basis of the way in which the proposals line up with a certain set of, you know, I, I said the part of the platform is not just a sort of technical, you know, trade-offs, and uh, uh, but also uh, how these uh, policy decisions and trade-offs articulate or, for, or, or represent or, or express a certain range of sort of more general values. So, I mean, I'm not saying that um, anybody, everybody can do it competently. I'm saying the epistemic task is less than were we all. And I guess maybe that's where the system independence thing uh, was, was, you know, there's something about the system independence, were we all, as it were, expected by some theory of democratic uh, competency to come up with our own uh, sort of visions about what um, good or ideal platforms might be. So I'm not saying the, 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 the epistemic task is, is insignificant, it's easy peasy, right? But it's less than that sort of, we are all, as it were, uh, independent uh, uh, entrepreneurs of our own sort of platforms, which we then compare to the ones that are being offered by the parties. Does that sound? But, so it's not that maybe it's not about platforms versus issue specific, it's about proposed or unproposed right, maybe. Yep. issues. Um, Thanks. And that is that clearly is an epistemic benefit. You only have to concentrate on a vastly shrunk set of issues. Okay. okay so we, we will take a quick, quick common questions by uh, François, uh, Peter, and André. Okay. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, just really short question on, in fact, your kind of your first point about uh, proportion, uh, proportionality on seats, bringing uh, this proportion on uh, influence. Uh, I wonder if we should make a difference between kind of token influence, so one election on one uh, influence on one election results, that's it, and uh, let's say long-term influence, right? So if you have you know a, a, a party having five percent of the votes and then getting you know the Ministry of you know, Finance or something like that, and you say, oh God, this party has a lot of influence, but then like, over time, over elections, this party will be kind of in and out mm -hmm. of the coalition. Well, the big parties will kind of stay in the coalitions more of the time, and that might be kind of the, the property we want, right? So more proportionality of influence over the long term than on single shots like token. Uh, I, I don't even know if it works like mathematically, but that would be like a, perhaps a mathematical property of proportionality over time that would be different from from proportionality uh, single shot. Hmm, that's interesting. I so uh, Marc Antoine asked me to be brief in my answers, and my brief answer is, that's interesting, I'll have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> as, as Aberdeen said in the comments, the, 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 the weakness of proportional representation is that it uh, might over-represent the influence of small parties, and the weakness of first past the post is that it will under-represent the influence. And in your response, you said, well, you know, for historically disenfranchised uh, groups, what we should do we should, we should, uh, is to, to develop substantive policies that give them more influence rather than look for structural means. Uh, now, I, I agree with Frederick that there might be, that there's not just the case of historically disenfranchised groups, right. but there's also minorities that might bring change, for instance, Green Party. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and there it seems to me that reaching for a structural uh, or hybrid solution, such as, for instance, in the proportional representation in Europe, <laughs> the 5% threshold, in order to get in. Yeah. And one might also think of similar tweaks that you could bring to first past the post to give minorities more votes. Yeah. Um, so I want to push you a bit more. Why not? Why not reach for these structural means to counteract the weaknesses of the, of the two systems? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just very briefly, uh, you know, I, I mentioned somewhere in the paper that uh, one of the ways in which proportional representation systems and advocates and fixed proportional representation has been by deproportionalizing it, which in a way I take to be, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it in a way goes in the direction of my argument rather than, uh, rather than, than against it. 
Let me say something about, uh, you know, um, I think there's virtue. And again, this is very ideal theoretical and may not match up with the way in which first past the post Big Ten parties are instantiated in Canada or elsewhere in the, in, today. I think there's virtue, say, when, um, uh, when you have within a Big Ten party a Green Caucus, right, that has to uh, sort of deliberate and negotiate and arrive at compromises with uh, the Labour Caucus, right? Uh, I mean, I'm struck in left-wing politics how, uh, you know, green issues and labor issues have come to seem to be at, at loggerheads because you have traditional labor parties and, tra and less traditional green parties. Um, I say, you know, there is a virtue if uh, uh, a big tent party is one that forces, as it were, through, uh, you know, uh, green caucuses, labor caucuses, et cetera, to uh, bring their concerns to the table and hash out, um, you know, a set of compromises that reflect both views. It requires tweaking, and this Aberdeen was absolutely right, it requires tweaking to the actual rules that govern the party structure. Fabio Volkenstein um, has a wonderful paper in Journal of Political Philosophy from about three or four issues ago on intra-party democracy, like starting to think about how to tweak the actual functioning of parties to achieve intra-party democracy. But I think the potential is there in Big Ten parties more than it is when the structure of the electoral system pits say a Labour Party and a Green Party in opposition to one another rather than inviting them within a structure to find common ground. Thank you. Then Andre, Gloria. Uh, so a, a very brief point, which I think is a more a question of formulation than, than the actual claim behind it. At the beginning you say that we might think of political preferences as an alternative way of formulating what the input is about, the content of the input, and that just struck me as a bit weird. Yeah. Uh, because it seems that you, you, by thinking of political preferences as an alternative to votes, you seem to imply that votes are not uh, doing just that, revealing yeah. preferences. Yeah. Uh, so that's one point. And second, which saying, well, we have, we should think about input in terms of political preferences. That's way too general. Yeah. Uh, and you're not. It seems that you're not giving the full story on what the proxy, the out, this other alternative proxy for political preferences on a non-vote account. Would be so. It yeah. seemed that there was something. Yeah, else. yeah. You, you're right. I, I, that, 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 that's very messy, and I have to fix that up when, when you know, in, in further iterations of of this paper. Uh, the point that I was trying to make is one that is far less uh, controversial, I think, widely accepted, which is that you know, there's a picture according to which we have political preferences, and then we just sort of pour them into the vote, sort of undistorted. And what I'm saying is, you know, voting systems, different kinds of ways of of actually registering our vote on ballots that look different, uh, get different kinds of information. I mean, think about uh, you know the point that uh, Amartya Sen and uh, Eric um, Meskin made in the New York Times during the Republican primaries. They said, "Look, you know, it's not that Republicans prefer Trump; it's that the way in which the system is designed elicits a Trump vote." Right? If we had um, a, some kind of a board account system. Right, which asks people to uh, engage in pairwise comparisons. Trump would have been out, uh, you know, within a month of the beginning of the, uh, because though you know a substantial number of people prefer him, a far greater number of people disprefer him. Right, would place him last if there was a ranked ballot. And so, um, you know, the idea is basically that um, you know uh, votes are kind of vote different voting systems, different ways of registering our preferences on uh, ballots are, you know. Are going to have an impact on the kind of information that they get out of uh, out of us, and there may be no perfect way of uh, of doing that. But that was very you're right that that was very awkwardly stated in the paper. Okay, so we're on time. Thank you very Thank much, you. Daniel. Thank you.